After President Trump's rally last night in Phoenix, Arizona, it is being reported that the entire mainstream media have been admitted to urgent care for a massive overdose of Kefefe. We'll report as new details emerge. Plus, Antonia Okafor, Amanda Prestigiacomo, and Jacob Airy join the panel of deplorables to discuss ESPN's removing an Asian sports reporter because his name is Robert Lee, the possible pardon of Sheriff Joe Arpaio, and Hillary's endless whining that the American people rejected her. I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. I cannot possibly describe how much I loved this rally last night. I, I actually, I wasn't even watching it live. I was at an event at the Hollywood Bowl and a buddy of mine in New York, my friend Bill, we've worked on a million campaigns together, good old Republican. He texts me, he says, I hope you are smoking a cigar and watching this right now. It is extraordinary. It is Trump at the heights of his powers. It, it, I, I know that all the shows today are gonna be talking about this. I don't care. I don't care if we're all doing the same show. <laughs> I love it so much. There's actually too much good stuff in it to talk about. There's the Joe Arpaio stuff. There are the protesters outside who just rioted for no reason. They didn't have any Nazis to fight against. It. The, this rally actually reminded me a little bit of President Trump's Excellent speech he gave in Rome. Do we have it in ancient Rome? Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Is this not why you are here? That is exactly why I am here. That is the only reason I am here. It was so, it was just a wonderful, we had last night, or two nights ago rather, his speech about the Afghanistan policy. It was very good. It was sober. It was presidential. He became humble for the first time in many of our eyes. He acknowledged that he was going to change directions. He wasn't going to tell people what his plans were. He wasn't going to let the terrorists know when he was getting out. And then he gives pure Kofefe campaign today. And he, and he masterfully plays on the entertainment of politics, the retail politics, not the sort of stuff that they talk about on CNN, not the sort of things that we talk about in think tanks, but just the stuff of politics that make people tune in, that make people turn off reality TV and watch the best reality TV show out there. So how did the media react? I, I don't know which was more fun, watching the speech or watching the reactions. The, this was, I, so I, I woke up this morning and I just took a look at CNN.com and WashingtonPost.com. Now, these are headlines just from above the fold. It's kind of hard to tell what above the fold is now because we don't have physical newspapers, but these are the main headlines on the website. I'll just run down them from CNN. Chris Eliza says, Donald Trump's 57 most outrageous quotes from the Arizona speech. And in that piece, he says, full of invective, victimhood, and fact-free retellings of historical events. This is literally the first line of his speech. Literally. And then it's just a bunch of whining about how Donald Trump punched them in the face. Other headlines on CNN.com this morning. These are all same morning, right next to each other. James Clapper calls Trump's speech downright scary and disturbing. Russian ambassador downplays Trump relationship. I don't know why we're talking about Russia again, but they have to distract from this rally somehow. Hillary Clinton, my skin crawled when Trump stood behind me. My, well, tr Trump hasn't stood behind her since debates nine months ago, but they, had to, they brought this back up to try to get Trump's excellent speech out of the news. Melania Trump's thanks Chelsea Clinton for defending Barron. I guess Donald didn't defend Barron. Thank you, Chelsea. Meghan McCain slams man at Trump rally who called for her father's death. Don't know who the man was at the Trump rally. Probably nobody. Doesn't really matter. The, I, I'm not sure why we care what Meghan McCain thinks about this. And why, what is this relevant? Why is this relevant after <laughs> Donald Trump has addressed serious points in that rally and actually made some news? Uh, and then, of course, the last one. Trump can stay sane for approximately 24 hours. If this is insane, bring it on. Admit me to an asylum. Washington Post similar, similarly reports on their above the fold headlines. As Trump ranted and rambled, his crowd slowly thinned. I didn't see that. I don't know. I was watching. Maybe the cameras weren't good enough where I was. And the only people I saw outside were the rioting leftists. I didn't see a lot of Trump's. I didn't see a lot of MAGA hats walking around filing out of the auditorium. Another one. Trump's vicious attack on the media shows one thing clearly. He's running scared. <laughs> is that Marshall? Is that the uh, feeling you got at that rally? He's running scared. Uh, yes. That's a, I, yeah, maybe we were watching different rallies then. He is vicious attack on the media. He's running scared. Doesn't seem to be running to me. Seems like he's standing his ground and punching these jerks in the face. 
Quote, James Clapper questions Trump's fitness, worries about his access to nuclear codes. I'm not worried. President Trump is deteriorating before our very eyes. Didn't you see him melting there? But they All of these headlines, by the way. Is that are, like biologically? Is that what they mean? That, that might be what they're talking. I think they're projecting. I think it's all psychological. I think all of these headlines are referring to themselves. They look at President Trump and he is a mirror and they see themselves deteriorating, turning into nothing. Another one, uh, Trump's attacks on GOP senators are self-defeating. I'm not sure about that. I, we haven't in all these special elections that have come up since the election, the, the people who have supported President Trump and who President Trump has supported have won Republican uh, candidates for high office. And it seems to me that uh, there's no reason not to believe that President Trump will have coattails in the future. Uh, Trump in Arizona shows just how unfit he is. I didn't see that. Hillary Clinton calls Donald Trump a creep saying her skin crawled during a debate nine months ago that we're reporting on for absolutely no reason. But the best of all were none of those headlines. The best of all was CNN's Don Lemon. What we have witnessed was a total eclipse of the facts. Someone who came out on stage and lied directly to the American people and left things out that he said in an attempt to rewrite history, especially when it comes to Charlottesville. He's unhinged. It's embarrassing, and I don't mean for us, the media, because he went after us, but for the country. This is who we elected President of the United States, a man who is so petty, petty that he has to go after people who he deems to be his enemy, like an imaginary friend of a six-year-old. His speech was without thought, it was without reason, it was <laughs> devoid of facts, it was devoid of wisdom, there was no gravitas, there was no sanity there. He was like a child blaming a sibling on something else. His imaginary enemies. You know his imaginary enemy, the media? <laughs> Speaking of rewriting history, does, what's going on down in the South right now? D does Don Lemon have any self-awareness whatsoever? Does Don... <laughs> he's saying we're, we're not... The media aren't the enemy. And he's giving this bizarre... He's saying President Trump is so emotional. He's unhinged. Listen to this craziness from this... Just like a child. Don Lemon himself behaving like a child before he gets to analysis. Clearly this was ad-libbed or was written during the speech. Uh, he couldn't have uh, prepared it beforehand and certainly didn't seem prepared enough beforehand. And this is nothing new, by the way. It, it's not that CNN, I think CNN wants to paint the picture that they're reacting to President Trump's totally uncalled for attacks. Let's take a trip down memory lane and look at CNN's Brian Stelter. President Trump's actions and inactions in the wake of Charlottesville are provoking some uncomfortable conversations, mostly off the air, if we're being honest. Mm. In discussions among friends and family and debates on social media, people are questioning the president's fitness. But these conversations are happening in newsrooms and TV studios as well. Usually after the microphones are off or after the stories are filed, after the paper's been put to bed, people's concerns and fears and questions come out. Questions that often feel out of bounds, off limits, too hot for TV. Questions like these. Is the president of the United States a racist? Is he suffering from some kind of illness? Is he fit for office? I can't believe we got Brian Stelter on that hot mic. You know, because these conversations, they're happening off the air. They're happening away from the microphones. I can't believe, he's, by the way, he, he's so cogent and articulate for being off mic, totally off the cuff, right? <laughs> they, I, it's, it's almost beyond parody. I don't know how much more I can say about this guy, but the, the self-seriousness of it. And he's saying, look, Honestly, they're happening off camera. If they're happening off camera, I don't know how there's enough time in the day because all of that which is on camera are these same conversations. But to say the, the total uh, obliviousness to say that these things are happening off camera and then to spout all of this conspiratorial nonsense into the camera, regular CNN, John Nolte has for years claimed that CNN is ISIS and Hitler. I don't, that might be a little, I think they're incompetent. I think both ISIS and Hitler were much more competent than CNN but uh, his antipathy toward them is perfectly understood. And uh, so James Freeman at the Wall Street Journal compiled a handful of examples that <laughs> re refute a number of what the, a number of things that CNN has said about this. Now let's see if those conversations are off the air. First, this comment. The American press is stronger than any demagogue, but President Trump's attacks do present 
real challenges. That's what today's program is about. Poison. <laughs> That's what it is. It's a verbal form of poison meant to affect your view of the media world, meant to harm news organizations. Off the air again, I guess. He's, he's got to watch out for these hot mics, Brian Stelter. Maybe it's his, his Amazon Echo or something. He's picking all of this up. Poison, he calls it. I'm glad that CNN is, is running away from hyperbole. Now, it isn't just this guy, though. It isn't just these new guys, Don Lemon and Brian Stelter. Here is Carl Bernstein, good old Carl Bernstein of Watergate fame, having a sober discussion about President Trump. Carl, I want to come to you. Uh, you're in Los Angeles this morning. Uh, you have been thinking about this, uh, talking about Trump uh, for months as a neo-fascist. I want you to tell me why and, and, and how you view this current moment. Well, it's, it's, it's a difficult term, and the word neo, meaning new, has a lot to do with it, a new kind of fascist mm. uh, in our culture, dealing with uh, an authoritarian, demagogic point of view, nativist, anti-immigrant, racism, bigotry that he appeals to. I will never forgive Bob Woodward for inflicting Carl Bernstein on us. I will never for he he gave Carl Bernstein a little byline 50 years ago, 40 years ago, and now that he's inflicted him on us forever to give his hysterical and hackish points of view all over air. Not just those guys. How about a presidential historian, a scholar, the historian contributor to CNN, Douglas Brinkley? Help us out. How do you convey what's going on with the Trump White House? Um, it's an utter disarray, and you can't really co compartmentalize everything because it's all morphed together as Donald Trump unfit mm. for command, in my opinion. I mean, you could go look at um, Godfather you said he's unfit for, Let me be clear. You said he's unfit for command. I think so. Now, let me be clear. Could you repeat that again, please? I need you to say on air again, he's unfit for command. Now go back to talking about the mobsters that you just Wait, referenced. Wait, Michael, could you one repeat that one more time? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Brian Stelter and this historian guy from some school in Texas says Donald Trump is unfit for command. But right, it's perfect. an imaginary enemy. It's an imaginary opponent. I don't know why. Donald Trump, he's, he's attacking like a child and his imaginary friend. I don't know why he thinks that the mainstream media are just Democrat hacks out to get him. Now, Brinkley, by the way, is not just the voice of the uh, academy. He's not just the voice of presidential history. He's also the voice of the American people. She's reminding us that one of Donald Trump's curses, I think he's brought to Washington, is the shrinking of the power of the presidency. Mm -hmm. uh, people yeah. used to really look up to the executive branch and, and uh, now every day Donald Trump seems to be doing something to make it look smaller. They really used to look, didn't you look up to Barack Obama, Marshall? Yeah. During those wonder of those eight years, you used to look right every day. I, my neck started to hurt. I was looking up to him so much. Now, this does seem a little confusing to me because beginning basically with the election of Barack Obama, certainly after the Affordable Care Act, Democrats started to lose every single election they tried to run. So they lost a thousand seats in state legislatures across the country. They lost a ton of governorships. 24 out of 32 Republican state legislature states went to Republican governors. They lost the Congress, they lost the Senate, and they ultimately lost the presidency. So it seems to me that perhaps not all of the American people looked up to that past president. It seems to me that perhaps Douglas Brinkley and CNN have no idea what at least half of this country thinks and they, they that's why this country loathes them and it's why they clearly hold half at least half of this country in utter disdain now this is this is my favorite one of all this is my favorite projection onto donald trump uh from these democrats and these hacks and these mainstream media journalists but i repeat myself and there's been questions about the uh, 25th uh, Amendment to the Constitution, whether or not he should be removed for medical reasons. But Senator Corker is a real leader among Republicans, and it was very brave of him to step out and really talk about the fact that we have an incompetent president and what does that mean for brave. our country. On the medical front, look, we all know he is a neon billboard for, you know, uh, overt narcissism. So brave, such get him the Arthur Ashe Courage Award. I can't handle the bravery. It's so I'm overwhelmed by the courage. Now there are there are two things in this that are pretty astounding, uh, and this is coming from Douglas Brinkley, the I assume psychiatrist, since he's diagnosing the president on air. He's or no, he's just a he's a hack historian at some college and a and a poor journalist. No, he there are two points here. One, he's talking about narcissism. Barack Obama wrote his first memoir by the age of 33. 
he wrote his second book about his favorite subject by the age of 45. As far as I can tell, all Barack Obama has ever written in his entire life are books about himself beginning right after he graduated college. Um, but on the other side, there are there is the media, which always talks about how irresponsible Trump is being, how, how rash he's being, he's shooting from the hip. And then they bring on some historian to diagnose uh, Donald Trump with narcissistic personality disorder on air. And that's fine. I'm more than happy to imply that Barack Obama is a narcissist. I'll say it explicitly. But CNN is purporting to present objective journalism. And they could not be f further from that. I have a lot more respect for MSNBC because when I go to MSNBC, they're pretty upfront with what they think. Daily Wire, we're pretty upfront with what we think. But CNN, it's just look at that panel that they had. My panel of deplorables is much more balanced than that CNN panel. And we do not go for balance. That is not not our, uh, our strength here. And so President Trump, he stands up to all of these guys. He pokes them in the eye. He, he's a master at politics and engaging this country. I don't know that he's a master of policy. I don't know that he's a master at White House strategy. I don't know that he understands the Beltway Lunch Club people at all. That He might not understand any of that, but he does get politics. And I think a lot of people, basically none of those people we've seen on CNN understand it. They don't understand politics, which is the art of relating to people, of talking to people, of hearing their concerns. It's the essentially human art. It's what separates us from the animals is politics. And President Trump communicates to them directly. He skips by all of their filter and uh, can engage with the American people. With that, we have got to bring on our panel of deplorables for this especially Kofefe show. We have Antonia Okafor, Amanda Prestigiacomo, and Jacob Airy. Thank you for coming on. Antonia, has the mainstream media always been this crazy or is Trump uniquely driving them insane? <laughs> Uh, I think definitely that they have gone to a different level with the the Trump administration and uh, the presidency. I think that they feel like now they are allowed to show they're crazy to the full extent. Mm. So, and people will buy into it and they'll get a lot of money for it. So, uh, I think it, it works for them. It it works for them to to play into the hysteria of of Trump and and what he does and. And I remember hearing that broadcast, my mom, like I said, is very liberal and progressive and listens to CNN every day. Um, and uh, I remember on Sunday, like, I know, it's really hard, it really is. <laughs> uh, we'll talk about that later. But, um, and them really saying like, does Trump have a mental illness? And me just being like, what the heck? Seriously, we're in this era when we're having this conversation. Like I'm going, to go to pray to Jesus after this. I'm going to church, it's Sunday morning, and I don't want to hear this nonsense. Um, but basically that's what we're hearing all the time and it's becoming normalized. So we, yeah, we live in it, an era. We live in an era where <laughs> mental illnesses are actual mental illnesses are completely normalized and it's bigotry <laughs> to suggest otherwise. But yet when the president says we need to enforce our laws, that is signs that he is lost his marbles. Uh, Jacob, why Arizona? Why now? Right after the Afghanistan speech, a week after Charlottesville, why is he giving this campaign-like rally in Arizona? Well, I was reading an article earlier today, and it said that it reminded everyone that is really where Trump's campaign took off. He had uh, launched his campaign, he was very low in the polls, and then he did this rousing speech mm. in Arizona, and that is what really propelled him into top tier status uh, during the 2016 GOP primaries. So I really uh, think that's why he did it. He remembers the city well, and don't forget that crowd, all his MAGA supporters, that was an electric cr crowd. They oh, yeah. were there to support him. And uh, one, one thing I would like to note is uh, Douglas Brinkley, he's not actually a Texan. He just plays one on TV. <laughs> he's actually from Georgia. I just wanted to point that out. That's an important distinction. I was there. I was in Phoenix about three days ago. If I would thought about it for five seconds, I would have stuck around for the rally. <laughs> it, it is true. A, pe a lot of people there carrying their guns and wearing their MAGA hats. I saw it was, it was nice to be in a refreshingly sane part of the country. But your, your point is right, Jacob. He is re he's playing to his strengths here. He's clearly really good at these rallies. He's, he's playing to his core competency. Amanda, why is he so good in this format? He's pretty good. At tw Twitter's a mixed bag. He can be great and he can be pretty cringe-inducing at times. He gave that very solid Afghanistan speech, but he is electric in these rallies. They're clearly, he's better than anybody we've ever seen do them. Why is he so good at them? Why are these 
rallies the medium for Donald Trump? Yeah, I mean, he's been doing this his whole life. I mean, he was literally on WWE. I mean, he's an entertainer first and foremost. So this kind of stuff is just second nature to President Trump. And it really does just bolster his base. I'm sure there were a lot of people um, within his base were worried after Bannon was outed because they felt like there was no one there speaking to that populist base. And there really was no difference. He was talking about ripping up NAFTA. He was talking about the wall, shutting down the government if we don't get the wall, uh, Sheriff Arpaio. So, I mean... This was just kind of reinvigorating his base. And like you said, it, I mean, it, th this is Trump. This is second nature. This is why, with no political experience, he made it to the White House. Uh, he is an entertainer. He can captivate his audience. And he knows how to directly speak to people like he's been doing his whole life. It certainly reinvigorated me. I was at the bowl <laughs> listening to the LA Philharmonic do The Planets. And as I'm listening to just the bringer of war and destruction, I'm reading all these Trump tweets and I couldn't possibly be more reinvigorated. All right, our there next story. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, oh, there, there was one point where I get, I mean, I saw it in a tweet from a reporter, but cause I didn't see all of it. But I guess apparently Trump said that CNN is not even airing this rally, and it was live on CNN. He saw it, and he's just trolling <laughs> the media so well. It's I did so hear that. Funny. Oh, like, those, oh, those lights are going off. Those camera lights are turning off. <laughs> it just messes with them. So our next story we have to talk about is was brought to my attention by Antonia Okafor. It is the best story I've read in a long time, mm -hmm. but if you don't subscribe to The Daily Wire, then you can't see it. You have to go over right now to thedailywire.com. Thank you to everyone who's already subscribed. You can go and watch the rest of the show live. Uh, it's $10 a month, $100 a year. You get me. You get Andrew Klavan. You get The Ben Shapiro Show. But forget all of that. All of that is worth so much less than this. The finest compartment for beverages known to man that has ever graced the face of the earth, the Leftist Tears Tumbler. It keeps your Leftist Tears hot or cold, and depends on the time of year. Sometimes in winter, I like them hot with a, some marshmallows on top. In the summer, I prefer iced leftist tears. You can keep either in here. They are always salty and delicious. Go over right now to thedailywire.com. You will get all of those things. We'll be right back. You know, first thing in the morning, I wake up, and typically my first thought is Antonia Okafor. So I go to Twitter, and I'm so glad that I did, because Antonia brought this story to my attention. <laughs> ESPN has confirmed that it pulled Asian American sportscaster Robert Lee off of the University of Virginia's home opener football game. Quote, this is them copying to it, simply because of the coincidence of his name. <laughs> Amanda, is there any role for parody left in the world, or has ESPN <laughs> transcended that, smashed that, and uh, and left us all babbling idiots? Yeah, it's over. I mean, last <laughs> night, another writer for the Daily Wire, we were just going back and forth, and we didn't we didn't know if it was real. She's like, "Should I even go forward with this?" I'm like, "No, no, 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 it can't be real." And then it ended up, you know, she got an email from ESPN that it was real. I mean, we didn't even believe it. Um, basically, this guy has a in, you know, a traditionally Asian last name, so he was punished because it resembled a <laughs> Confederate general. I mean, it's, it's unreal. It's beyond parody. They, you know, I think they wanted to prevent this from becoming a meme and having people talk about Robert Lee. But as a result, if you get a chance to go on Twitter today, the visual memes that people have made of this Asian reporter's face on Robert E. Lee's body riding a flag, it's just absolutely <laughs> tremendous. Thank you, ESPN. Uh, Jacob, that network, ESPN, has struggled for years with declining viewership as it makes its coverage of sports somehow political. I don't know how they do it, but they've managed to do it. Is this the nail in the coffin? Is this thing finally done forever? Oh yeah, I, I think so. It, it, what's what's worse is ESPN was called out for doing this months ago, right? And they said, you know what? Forget you. Forget our fans. We are going to double down on this. And now their political correctness has just gone too far. This is ridiculous. I think I think this is the 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 middle of the end for ESPN. I can't watch it anymore. I, not that I, I don't love watching sports, but I do love watching baseball and Sports mm. Center sometimes. Can't watch it. It's just their their yeah. coverage has become beyond the pale. That's Antonio, why there's the e MLB network. <laughs> that's true. I that's what I subscribe to now so I can watch baseball. Antonia, on a serious point, 
is this evidence that we're living in two different Americas? The it's hard. By the way, it's hard to make Asian Robert E. Lee serious, but we'll try. We'll do our best at the end of the whole show. <laughs> Are these two different Americas? There was clearly a board meeting. Somebody had uh, meetings and memos to discuss whether they need to pull a guy because his name is Robert Lee. It seems totally insane to, I think, most Americans, but clearly some people think this is a serious issue worth doing. Has the culture split so much, the common culture evaporated so much that we're in these irreconcilable cultural camps? Well, I feel first that, you know, as a, as a reward to the people who've subscribed, that I should give some non-fake news uh, credibility to New York Times, right? And actually talk about the state and say the actual statement where it says, we collectively made the decision, like right there, collectively. I'm just like, okay, well, we already know what the issue is, is collectivism. This is ESPN um, collectively made the decision? <laughs> yes, ESPN collectively made the decision. And then it says at the end, um, what was it? Uh, in that moment, it felt right to all parties. It's a shame that this is even a topic of conversation. It's a shame that this is even a topic yeah, of conversation. Yeah, it is a shame. <laughs> I yes. agree. Look, we yes, all agree. Yes, yes. <laughs> we all agree. Listen to your own words, please. Um, yeah, I think it definitely is. It's too, when I found about it, out about it yesterday, I too was looking at the Twitter sphere and I was like, no, there's, there's no way. And then finding out quickly that it's true. And just weeping, weeping for our country. <laughs> that, um, it, I don't know, it makes a testament to me that I'm like, okay, if I hear CNN or somebody else saying, and New York Times even now, I'm just like, okay, fake news, whatever. But now I'm like, okay, ESPN? Ooh, man, I just feel like that is more the middle America, right? It certainly so used to at be. Least a little yeah. part of it. it used to be now, but it's really a testament to where everything is going. It's just, you know, I'm, I'm, it's yeah, it's a sad thing. It's a sad reality now that they feel that this is going to be an issue for people that people are so offended now. And so therefore, they're going to just not take that risk. And you know what? Maybe people would have been offended. That's the problem, too. People might have been offended. With <laughs> that's true. <right. laughs> you know, it, it's that's just, a great point. It's it's, it's not a totally unrealistic fear that there would be some backlash to it. I'm sorry, Amanda, go ahead. Yeah, no, I'm just saying it just shows how insulated they are. Was there not one moderate or conservative person around to be like hey this is totally insane <laughs> there was not one voice of reason i mean we like at, at google when we saw they were just excising people who dared to you know break their diversity code it's just we're all in these little enclaves and there's no diversity of thought and this is what conservatives and classical liberals have been fighting for and this is just an example of that where there's there is no other thought i mean Really, there, there was not even a moderate to say this is totally insane. They just, yeah, this this sounds right. I mean, it's, it's This is the Andrew now. Clavin theory of newsrooms, which is not, yeah. the, the way to fix newsrooms, he says, is not to get a bunch of moderates or a bunch of people who don't have political opinions. It's to get at least one or two mm -hmm. conservatives in there. And just so that when people do things like that and they start talking about things that are so fringy and absurd, the conservative can say, hey guys, maybe we should put the brakes on this for a second. <laughs> I think we at least I need think, to build. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, just Clay Travis, the reporter who broke this, was on Tucker Carlson, and he made the point that only 4% of, of sports reporters voted um, for President Trump. I mean, it's it's monolithic again. It's just, it's crazy. I'm sure 94% of sports viewers voted for Trump, but there is a difference right. between the media and the base. I think yeah. we what we need to do is build a statue to the sportscaster Robert Lee. If anybody puts that together, I will donate. I will be the first check that gets mailed out. Now we need to talk about, and, I'm sorry, go ahead. Before we talk about it, oh, I don't sorry. want to cut off Antonio Okafor. <laughs> I was going to say, I think it's important also to know that this is a part-time job for this man. He is a payroll services he works full time at a payroll services company in Albany. Wow. But also, I, the, they told him that instead of covering this game, he's going to instead be covering next month the University of Pittsburgh's game, which their mascot is the Panthers. So I'm just thinking, why wouldn't Black Panthers be upset with this? <laughs> so I just really you are seeing ahead of the that curve. Not really help. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. September 2nd, I promise you, that will be the next outrage. Well, come back next month. I'm sure we'll be talking about it. Last night, President Trump hinted that America's toughest sheriff, Joe Arpaio, might receive a pardon for a conviction he had. It's a little complicated, but he was convicted of being in contempt of court because he 
kept uh, rounding up illegal immigrants, basically. But there was a worry that he was uh, racially profiling. That, uh, Barack Obama's DOJ called him out on this. And so anyway, there's a chance that President Trump will pardon him. Uh, let's see the clip. I could just stare at that image all day. Do we have the video? <laughs> was Sheriff Joe convicted for doing his job? That's what... He should have had a jury, but you know what? I'll make a prediction. I think he's going to be just fine, okay? But, but, I won't do it tonight because I don't want to cause any controversy. Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can't. You can't help but love the guy, Jacob. Is there is there any actual worry that this flouts the rule of law, or or is Trump right? It was Arpaio prosecuted for doing his job. Personally, I think Arpaio was prosecuted uh, for doing his job, but. Honestly, President Barack Obama commuted the sentence of a traitor. So the left doesn't need to be throwing stones at, at this. You know, those who live in glass houses should not throw stones. So I, I'm for him pardoning Sheriff Opio, uh, Arpaio and uh, Dinesh D'Souza, President Trump, if you're listening. So, you know, that's just, my, that's just my take on it. I think that Sheriff Arpaio was doing his job. He was watching out for the safety of his citizens and his constituents. And he was uh, persecuted by the left. Antonia, the allegations are going to fly. I can, like you, I can see ahead a few news cycles. I can <laughs> see where the fake news media are going to go with this. Allegations are going to fly that he is excusing racial profiling, that President Trump is making an excuse to round up Hispanic people of all legalities. And this is coming one week after Charlottesville. Do you think that uh, this is a bad idea to do it so close to that heated event? Or is this just more evidence that the Trump train has no brakes. <laughs> uh, the Trump train has no brakes. Yeah, I think, to be honest, especially watching that video was just a testament of that Trump does not care. I think after the second time he did his speech after Charlottesville, he just like, no, you know what? <laughs> I am not going to win on this issue ever. So I'm just going to be, I'm just going to say what's on my mind. I'm just going to rally, rally up these people who are, you know, pro the sheriff and, you know, talk about it um, on, on, on news, on the news. And uh, I'm sure people are going to be upset about it. I don't, but you know what? He has, he has a lot of, you know, um, diddly on this, that he basically has been able to say anything that really would have been with anybody else been okay and have the media spin it to something that they want it to be. So, uh, I don't think he's ever going to win with that. So he might as well just be who he is. And a lot of Republicans out there, even <laughs> past presidential nominees, would say, well, I didn't mean this. I didn't say that. And they'll, they would react to the, the mainstream media coverage. And Trump just seems to say, <laughs> forget about it. You're never going to love me. And I'm going to move on. Now, Amanda, all of this signals that President Trump actually intends to fulfill his campaign promise of reducing illegal immigration and uh, deporting criminals and building the wall. Do we think that that is actually going to happen over the last month or so? It has become increasingly unlikely. What are the odds that we actually build the wall? Uh, I, th I mean, I think the odds are good. I think it's, <laughs> it's going to happen. Um, I think people like Ann Coulter, um, his base need to keep putting pressure on President Trump. I mean, it's nice to have a rally, but they need to see some actual action. Um, but but that said, we've already had, I think it's 50, like 50% of a decrease of illegal crossing. So like this has been said before, President Trump kind of is a wall, a virtual wall. So he's already done a lot. <laughs> a big, beautiful um, wall, right. Yeah, he really has, really has done a lot to kind of curb that. So, um, but of course we want a physical wall. So, you know, future administrations cannot just, you know, revoke these rules or what have you. So um, I think it's, I think for sure we'll, we'll have more um, how do we handle immigration? Because it does play so well with the base. Um, and that was one of the main issues that got him to the presidency. So I think it would be foolish if he didn't. Um, so, you know, I know Bannon's gone, but still, I, I think it would make sense for him to go ahead with this. And I, I don't see why he wouldn't. Um, so I, I kind of feel like it'll happen. I agree. There is this sense. I'm not sure that I even really care about the wall itself. I just want <laughs> him to build it. 
I want him to build it for the credibility of the borders of the United States and to shut up the mainstream media and the lefties who suggest that controlling your own immigration policy is somehow bigoted or wrong. I, I right. really want him to, and this is true of a lot of aspects of his presidency, I want him to do them, even if I don't care especially about the actual policies themselves. Well, spe yeah. speaking yeah, of the presidency. It's good to make them mad, so. Speaking of the presidency, we have to move on to someone who is not president, Hillary Clinton. <laughs> Hillary Clinton has a new book coming out titled What Happened, Hillary Rodham Clinton. Now, when you look at the cover, it says, the title is What Happened and the byline is Hillary Rodham Clinton, but I think that might as well just all, all be the title. Here is a quote. She just released it today for some reason, probably to distract from this rally. Quote, my skin crawled. It was one of those moments where you wish you could hit pause and ask everyone watching, well, what would you do? She's referring to debating Trump when he was absolutely crushing her. Quote, do you stay calm, keep smiling, and carry on as if he weren't repeatedly invading your space? Or do you turn, look him in the eye, and say loudly and clearly, back up, you creep. Get away from me. I know you love to intimidate women, but you can't intimidate me, so back up. Isn't that like when, when someone insults you, and then three hours later, you think of a good comeback? That's like Hillary Clinton, except for 10 months later. It's really, to quote a great man, sad. Antonia, Democrats famously cannot take responsibility when they lose elections. They never get over it. We see it with Al Gore. We see it with Dukakis. Obviously, we see it with Hillary Clinton. Why is that? Republicans seem to move on just fine, but Democrats seem to just harp on it for the rest of their lives. Oh, sorry, I, I didn't hear the. You were mesmerized. You were mesmerized by Hillary Clinton's um, beautiful words. <laughs> Why is it the Democrats can't get over losing elections? No, like so. Think about all the problems. Yeah, so I know it's not only just that. You know, is it you know ten months later that you know she thinks it's a good comeback, but then she like hires someone else probably to write that comeback for her, and then <laughs> right. they don't do that great of a job either. That's basically what Hillary's uh, you know comeback is. So yeah, absolutely. I just think it's. I mean, another thing Republicans do a good job about about that. I mean, Mitt Romney had a freaking great Netflix movie that came out after his um, after him losing. And um, if anything, a lot of people are like, why didn't that come out beforehand? People probably would have voted for you more. Um, <laughs> right. But this is not going to be the same thing for Hillary. It's going to be like, just stop, like get over it. Um, know your comebacks work. This book, okay, great. You can buy your fourth home or something. Yeah. Um, you, may, you might still feel broke, but um, you can buy your fourth home now. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's basically it. And, uh, you know, I'm going to bite this one out, but... <laughs> I think it's the that's, Russians. That's, I think they're messing with your Skype connection. They're messing with your lights. What? <laughs> Jacob. Yes, yes, the, that's uh, Hillary's future. So. Jacob, are these attacks, <laughs> are they Are they a part of a Democrat strategy? Is this book, What Happened, and all of the things, Trump is a creep, he intimidates women, yada, yada, yada. Is this part of some larger Democrat strategy to defeat him in 2020? Or is it just Hillary Clinton throwing a temper tantrum and proving with each and every word that she's utterly unfit to hold the office of the presidency? <laughs> uh, well, I think it's a combination of both. It's basically the Democrats are running on we're not the party of Trump. And also, Hillary Clinton has always been vindictive. So she's going to, to, to say the least, you know, I'm being polite. Uh, she's always been vindictive. So she's saying, oh, she's a creep. She forgets that she's married to a creep. And she's kind of a creeper herself. I mean, as a lawyer, she defended a child rapist and, and basically victim shamed this, uh, the, poor, uh, the poor victim in the case. So... I think it's just sour grapes. She's just throwing a temper tantrum, as, as you said, and that's all there is to this. And her last book didn't sell well. Her husband's book sold better, ironically enough. But, so I, I think this book will just go nowhere for because everyone knows what happens. The DNC nominated Hillary Clinton. That's what happened. <laughs> When you say that Hillary Clinton is vindictive, are you insinuating that the Clintons keep suiciding people all around them? <laughs> I can neither confirm nor deny that. <laughs> we'll have to talk about that on a later episode. All right. Thank you to my wonderful panel of deplorables for being here, Amanda Prestigiacomo, Antonia Okafor, and Jacob Airy. Now it is time for my smart glasses and the final thought. 
if all you read were the Democrat hacks in the mainstream news media, you would have good reason to think that President Trump is not only Hitler, but Mecca Hitler. You would become more convinced with each story to that effect, and these purportedly objective, purportedly journalistic outlets each run dozens per day. But when you watch the man unfiltered, it becomes clear that he is not at all like the left-wing water carriers at virtually every major news outlet desperately wish to portray him. He has an essentially economic agenda, a vision of American greatness that a rising tide lifts all ships, and that this policy agenda must be coupled with a spirit of patriotism that overwhelms superficial categories that separate and divide the American people. It's an important message and one that Democrat operatives who play journalists on TV are desperately trying to pervert and suppress. Now more than ever, Republicans must come together with a clear vision and a single strategy. Quote, despite the constant negative press, Kofefe. I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. <laughs> come back tomorrow and we'll do it all again.